Hey everyone, I just picked up this GameCube off of eBay for a whopping $8 plus shipping. Uh, I think the whole thing ran to maybe 17 bucks total. Uh, it included the GameCube, the power brick, the AV cable, and a memory card. No controllers, no games, but that's okay. The reason I got it so cheap is because it was said to have problems reading discs. I haven't tested this thing out yet, and honestly, I haven't really even done much research into what to do to fix a GameCube that has this sort of a problem. So let's just say that today you and I are going to be learning something together. So I've got my old spare TV sitting here. Obviously it's signal signal because nothing's plugged in. Let's get the cables hooked up and see what it does when we throw a game in there. Okay, so I've got this guy hooked up and I also plugged in one of my own original GameCube controllers that I know works. Uh, I wish this thing had come with controllers because those things are still worth some money, but whatever, I, I've got one all tested out with it. Got the TV set to the right input here. I'm just gonna use a game that I know works. This disc is clean and in really good shape. Just Sonic Mega Collection. Uh, another th good thing to test when trying to do any sort of optical drive based testing is to note the position of where the laser lens is in relation to kind of the carriage assembly there. Notice that it's pretty close to the spindle. We'll see if that laser lens assembly moves at all when we power this thing on, assuming that it doesn't just work right off the bat. Maybe I'll get lucky and maybe the seller actually just had a bad disc and was thinking that this was a bad laser assembly, but whatever. Let's, uh, let's power this guy on and see what we get. I'm hearing clicking coming from the optical drive. Now it's not reading the disc because that's uh, not the, s the screen that you would see if it was reading the disc. It does seem to be working fine with the controller. Yeah, I see no disc. All right, so that means we need to tear this guy down a little bit and see what, if anything, it's doing. We know it's spun because the disc is in a different orientation than it was to begin with. And then also notice that carriage assembly moved a little bit. It moved towards the back. It's away from the spindle now. So that means that we're okay on this. The motor that moves the, lens, the laser back and forth works and we know that the spindle works because the disc was in a different position. So we probably have some sort of optical problem. It could be as simple as the lens is dirty. It could also be that the laser is burned out. The only way we can really tell for sure is to get this thing torn apart. So let me disconnect this and we'll get torn inside it. All right, so thankfully getting into these game cubes seems to be pretty easy actually. Obviously make sure that there's no disc inside there. Take out any memory cards or anything that you may have. Flip the unit over and then you're gonna need what's known as a game bit. I'm sure there's an official term for uh, for this type of bit, but you can see it's kind of a, it's almost like a reverse Torx. Uh, you'll get a better look at the head of the screw when I take it out, but you need one of these. So there's a look at that screw. See, it's kind of a weird reverse Torx. Nintendo's been using these for a long time, so it's nothing unique to the GameCube, thankfully. Then it's just a matter of lifting the shell off. Here's the inside. The whole door assembly with the spring and everything comes with it. So further disassembly is required if you need to really get in here and clean it. So here's the inside of the GameCube. Pretty compact unit. Uh, pretty nicely engineered. What I really like about it is it's fairly modular in terms of its design. Um, the front and back panels just kind of snap on. So that makes it really easy to take them out to clean. The front panel is pretty straightforward too. Just a couple of clips, one on either side. And then this will lift off. There's just a single ribbon cable holding this whole connector memory card assembly to the front. Uh, you do have to be careful, especially on this side of the ribbon cable because note that it's just soldered to the back side of that board. 
Uh, you pull this thing off or tear it and you're gonna be in a world of hurt. So here's the way to troubleshoot at least some of the functions of the laser. I like to start with that laser carriage again, close to the spindle. Simply pop a disc on there, carefully plug the console back in, and then if you notice back here, there is this plastic kind of two-pronged switch. You need to flip both of them back. What's interesting is that they are two independent switches. Um, you need to flip both of them back, and then you can press the power button and that'll fire the console up. Notice that the disc has spun up and the laser kind of came on. But it's having some weird problems here. It's possible that it wasn't able to read, which would indicate either a bad laser assembly or just a dirty lens. Now, I like to do the simple things first. So I'm gonna try and clean this lens. Let me grab some supplies real quick and let's give that a shot. So what I've got here is just a bottle of standard kind of household grade isopropyl alcohol. 70% uh, in case anyone's wondering. I don't know if different strengths are available in different countries. I guess I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm just dipping a, a, a cotton uh, swab here in that to soak it and then just very very gently and swab down that lens. Let's try it again here. That laser assembly is making some very weird noises. So I just did a little bit of research and it's suggesting that you may need to adjust a potentiometer inside this drive assembly. Uh, check this out. This is going to be a little tricky. Notice I've got a different game in there because um, with what I had to do, there was a very real risk that I would end up killing a game if I put one that I cared about in there. So it's spinning. Check that out. I have absolutely no intention of playing this game, but it worked. Let me show you what I did to fix it, and we'll see if I can do this one-handed. I had to throw the front panel on there because I had a feeling the GameCube would freak out without the front panel attached. So let's just gently pull that guy back out. What I had to do is you can see the big pile of screws. You have to undo all the screws. Take all these out. There's a few along the back here that go in along there. You got to pull all those out. On this side, the fan and power switch assembly just kind of lifts up and can flop out of the way. And then you've got to pull out all five of these screws. And so on the front here, you've got these little grounding straps on the top of the two memory card slots. You got to pull the four screws out of those too. Then what you're able to do is gently lift the entire optical drive assembly up and off of the GameCube. It just connects through that guy down at the bottom, which goes into that socket on the motherboard. The motherboard won't come out because you have to remove all the screws for that heat sink. But anyway, once you get the optical drive out, then you'll see that there are holes around the outside here for screws. And I put one screw back in just for, uh, just for good measure. Thankfully, uh, there was some information online I was able to, to glean about how to do this procedure. Unfortunately, you will need more than just screwdrivers to, to do this work, uh, at least if you want to do it with any reasonable suspicion of it actually working. For those playing along at home, it's manufactured by Panasonic. It's kind of a mini DVD type of a thing. And if you look right there, 
you notice that there's a very small component labeled VR401. VR in this case stands for variable resistor. And those with electronics engineering experience will realize that variable resistor also means potentiometer. This is essentially the volume knob for the laser. Now I need to stop right here and warn you, you have to be careful when doing this because if you don't do this right, you will potentially burn up the laser. So it's not just a matter of, well, crank, you know, the knob up until the laser, you know, has more power. In this case, more power is not necessarily what you want. You want the right amount of power. Some measurement has to be taken before and after you tweak this potentiometer. Let me show you how to do that. All right, so at least this gives me another excuse to use my awesome new Hyoki multimeter. I love this little thing. Go check out the review that I did a couple of months ago about it, the DT4252. Um, I, I really love this multimeter. I can't say it enough. And no, Hyoki isn't paying me to say that. Um, although they actually did find my review of this meter and they linked it on their Facebook, which is pretty awesome. So uh, thumbs up to you guys. Thanks, Hyoki. So there's three legs on this potentiometer. There's one on this side and two on this side. You want to measure the resistance between that leg and the lower of these two legs. What you want to see if this thing is calibrated correctly as from the factory is a value of somewhere between 200 and 500 ohms. I'll, I'll tell you what the meter originally said after I show you what it reads now, having tweaked that potentiometer. So we're at 435 and some odd change ohms. I'm assuming that towards the closer to that 200 range means the laser is brighter and you know more resistance means it's dimmer. That's my guess. Um, I'm not an expert on lasers, but anyway. With this potentiometer set the way it originally was, this meter was reading 0.636 kilo ohms, which puts it outside of that range. So the way you actually adjust this pot is you don't turn it up, you don't turn it clockwise. You would think, oh, let's, let's you know, adjust more power to the laser, right? So turn it clockwise. No, you actually turn it counterclockwise. So this direction, not this direction. I use just a small Phillips head jeweler screwdriver here and just go right in the middle of the pot and I gave it like an eighth of a turn perhaps. And before I put it all back together, I measured it again. So I threw it on the meter, 430 whatever ohms. I'm like, okay, let's, let's give that a shot. It's back within the range. And lo and behold, it works. So let me get this thing buttoned up real fast and uh and we'll play a little bit of gaming here make sure that it works for good and uh we'll call this one done All right, we've got her all back together here. Let's hit the power button, Let's see what we get. Sega. Yeah, boy. Bring me back to 1993. Oh, yeah, there you go. Now I can't play this thing one handed, that's for sure. Well, I can try. This is going to be interesting. I'm actually doing all right. See, I'm playing like this. Granted, it's a sign. Oh, no, I'm not doing all right. So yeah, I'm, I'm just glad we got this thing up and running again. 17 bucks with shipping. 
If I had thrown parts at it, probably not such a good deal, but since it was just a tweak, hey, I'll take it. As always, if you like this video, please give me the thumbs up. I do appreciate those quite a bit. They help. If you want to see more, click the subscribe button. It's right down there at the bottom. Um, I do videos about once a week. They're not necessarily always about video games, but I hope that at least it'll be of interest to most people who stumble upon my channel. And as always, thank you all so much for watching.